Our first panel this morning <clears throat> features three state attorneys generals who have made human trafficking a priority for their offices. Through their partnerships and innovative approaches to combating human trafficking, they have become leaders in the field. Please join me in welcoming the panelists on this morning's first panel. This first panel would be, will be moderated by Timothy Shea, Counselor to the Attorney General. Timothy J. Shea is the Counselor to the Attorney General of the United States. In that role, Mr. Shea advises the Attorney General on legal matters, law enforcement operations, and management issues impacting the U.S. Department of Justice, a cabinet-level department with a budget of $31 billion and 115,000 employees. Previously, Mr. Shea served as Associate Deputy Attorney General in the administration of George H.W. Bush, under then Deputy Attorney General, and later Attorney General William P. Barr. Mr. Shea has also served in congressional roles, including as Chief Counsel and Staff Director of the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, under the chairmanship of Senator Susan Collins, and on the U.S. House Appropriations Committee staff under ranking Republican member Silvio O. Conte. In state government, Mr. Shea served as the Chief of Public Protection Bureau in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Before joining the Department of Justice, Mr. Shea was in private practice at an international law firm. Please join me in welcoming our first panel of the day. Thank you very much. Are these uh, microphones working? Can people hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Stacey. I appreciate uh, your work as the uh, department's coordinator on human trafficking. She's done an outstanding job for us. I know many of you have worked with her. Uh, she's a great asset to, uh, to the department, the Attorney General. We appreciate all she does on this important issue. Um, <clears throat> I want to echo the uh, comments of the Assistant Attorney General um, and highlight the importance of this issue to the Department of Justice. Uh, the Attorney General, uh, this is one of his highest priorities. I've talked to him many times about it. He's very interested in how the Department is executing on our strategy because this is an essential element to our violent crime strategy and we, we, we consider this human trafficking issue, this modern day slavery to be a top priority for us. And he's personally involved in some of the cases as well as the policy uh, on executing with uh, all of our partners, both in government and out. So I think this is an important um, day to be here highlighting this, this, this um, important issue on this uh, anniversary year. And I also think it's key that we're starting off with a panel of state attorneys general. I've had a, in my career, I've had an opportunity to both work in one of those offices, but also work with them for many years. And, they are uh, truly um, partners for the Department of Justice uh, and with many, many uh, private sector uh, entities. And they are partners both in civil and criminal matters in, in a variety of things, includes antitrust and consumer protection and environmental and, and the like. And they are, as chief law enforcement officers of their state, essential to the system we have to protect America. And I, I can't stress the importance enough of the, the value that we, uh, that we place on our cooperation with our, with our partners in state government led by the attorneys general. And in, particularly on this issue, they've been a very strong and loud voice and consistent voice on human trafficking. I re remember even before I really re realized how important this issue was when I was in the private sector, um, attorneys general before General Jennings was involved, but Paxton and Reyes talking about this issue where a lot of people didn't really know what it was about. And they educated a lot of people, uh, both inside and outside in government, about the importance of this. So they've been out there consistently and for a long time on this. So it's appropriate that we start with, with them. And they've really made this issue both uh, within their states, nationally, and even internationally uh, a priority. So we, 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 it's appropriate we start with them. So let me start by just uh, introducing our panel, and then we'll get into some discussion about the issues that they have faced and what, what we see here uh, nationally. 
Um, Delaware Attorney General uh, Kathleen uh, Jennings to my right is, uh, took office, is relatively new AG. She took office in 2019, but she's a very experienced prosecutor in many different areas of the law. She's handled criminal cases, uh, both domestic violence, sexual assault, and murder cases. She's also had leadership roles in the state, including as uh, Chief Deputy Attorney General and as a state prosecutor in the Delaware Department of, of Justice. And prior to her election, she served as the Chief Administrative Officer in Newcastle County. Uh, she's a leader on human trafficking, and she's used uh, the unique statutes they have in Delaware to, to advance this cause, and we look forward to hearing hearing about that from her. Uh, to my left is uh, the 51st Attorney General of Texas, first elected in 2014. He's serving his second term. Uh, Ken Paxton leads an important state AG office with more than 4,000 employees. That's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people to manage, Ken. Uh, in 38,000 divisions, uh, th 38 divisions and 117 offices around the state. He's a true multi-state leader that comes in a long tradition of Texas giving us great AGs and Senator Cornyn and, and uh, Governor Abbott. Uh, and they've also, and Texas has been, because of the leadership of Attorney General Paxson, the forefront of the human trafficking issue. Right after he got into office, he, he established the uh, Human Trafficking and Transnational Organized Crime Section in his office. It's tasked with combating uh, trafficking, uh, human trafficking across the state. We look forward to uh, talking to him about that. He worked with the Department of Justice and the California Attorney General's office to take down Backpage.com. Uh, the Assistant Attorney General talked about that. Ken Paxson was instrumental in that, in that effort. It was the largest purveyor of, of uh, escort services and human trafficking online, and we did, they, were, they destroyed that, basically destroyed that page and that internet access. Uh, he also developed a powerful training video. We've used his bully Pope, and he's trained over 25,000 people across the state on human trafficking issues, so he's been a leader out there. And then finally, uh, we have Utah Attorney General uh, Sean Reyes, who you'll, you'll see how excited Sean is about this issue. He was first elected uh, in 2013. He's the Utah's 21st Attorney General. He's a leader among the states on a variety of issues, including high tech and especially human trafficking. Uh, shortly after taking office, he <clears throat> successfully led the statewide investigation and prosecution of Victor Rax, who's a notorious international gang leader. Uh, Rax trafficked, trafficked scores of minors in Utah over 15 years, but he repeatedly eluded prosecution until General Reyes brought him to justice. And ever since then, he's made this a priority within Utah and nationally. He's uh, pushed prosecutions in his state uh, and also across the country in a multi-state setting. Uh, he's clearly recognized as a global leader in, in human trafficking. He's been personally and passionately involved in these, and we're going to hear a little bit more about his activities in that area uh, today. So we have really, truly a distinguished panel of, uh, to start off our conference, and I, I want to start by just uh, thanking them for coming and, and, uh, and appreciate uh, their time here today. Uh, we're going to start off with just with a general question with um, our panelists and let them both all answer it. Uh, and, and we can start with, with Attorney General uh, Jennings uh, and ask her, like, how did you become interested in human trafficking? Why is that a priority for, for your state? Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a real honor to serve on this panel with all of you. Uh, we, uh, we are united in the fight against human trafficking as we are united with everyone who is here today. I got involved uh, passionately on this issue decades ago. As was mentioned by Tim, I, I've prosecuted cases most of my career. In the Attorney General's office in Delaware, we have unique jurisdiction in that we are both a district attorney and an Attorney General's office. So we have full criminal jurisdiction. I was assigned many years ago to a task force investigating Delaware's only serial killer. We spent a year tracking him, identifying him, and uh, finally arresting him. I spent the next year preparing for trial and trying the case against him successfully. This man, Stephen Brian Pinnell, uh, abducted, tortured, and then murdered five women who were engaged in the sex trafficking industry. 
They came from all walks of life. Um, they led very difficult lives. They walked up and down the Route 40 corridor, um, engaging in sex trafficking, and they met horrific ends. During the course of the investigation, I just wanted to learn how did this happen? How did they end up on the Route 40 corridor? And in the course of that investigation, I met dozens, dozens of human trafficking victims. All adults, some barely adults. And to a person, I learned the deeply troubled lives they had led as children neglected, abused, uh, many sexually abused as teenagers and abused over and over again as adults. They didn't choose these lives. They were controlled by others. And I determined back then to really treat what people just called prostitution and prosecuted it very differently. At the end of the trial, um, after Stephen Brian Pennell was convicted, I was really grateful for the jury, for the result, for justice. But really the most amazing thing that happened to me was about a week after his conviction, I received a bouquet of flowers on my desk. And it was from the women of Route 40. And they said, thank you, all of you on the prosecution team for treating us with dignity and respect for the first time. I will never forget that. And in the decades that followed, I have really sought to help people um, who are caught up in this world and to make sure that, that they're treated with dignity and respect. Thank you, General, appreciate that. General Paxton. Well, first of all, I wanna thank um, each of you for being here, because you have obviously putting time and effort into being here. I wanna thank the Department of Justice for making this a priority because we're, Texas is not gonna solve this alone, Delaware is not gonna solve this alone, Utah is not gonna solve this alone. We need to work together because this is a, a scourge on society. It's, it is something that, that needs to be addressed and addressed as quickly as we can. I knew nothing about human trafficking until uh, my last term in, in the legislature in the Texas Senate, sitting in a committee meeting and a Democrat senator from uh, San Antonio, Letitia Vandepute, was introducing a bill to deal with human trafficking. And I, I was just stunned by the testimony. And I don't know if it was because I have three daughters or I, I don't know what gripped me, but I was, I was stunned and horrified by the stories that I was hearing, by the testimony that I heard. And when the hearing was over, I, I asked uh, Senator Van De Pute if she had any Republican sponsors. And she said, no. And I said, well, I want to help you. And from that moment on, I felt committed to that issue, and we passed her legislation. And I promised myself that if I had more opportunities in the Senate, if I had opportunities in the future, that this was going to be a, something that I would deal with the rest of my life until we made progress in eliminating human trafficking, just like we ended human slavery in this country many decades ago. And so when I became Attorney General, I didn't have the resources. There was no human trafficking unit in my office, we spent a year sort of patchworking this together with no legislative resources. I wanted to show the legislature that this was an important issue and that, we, that there was a problem and that we needed to address it more than we had addressed it in the, in the past. And so it took us about a year. Uh, we started off with just a, a small number of people, three, three prosecutors, a few investigators, and one uh, uh, victim's assistance person. And that was the beginning of our unit. With the, with, after the first year I was in office and, and we were, within the first eight months, uh, very fortunate to, to really go after a huge target. We were part of, as, as was mentioned earlier, the Backpage.com takedown. And, and the reason that was so important, we were convinced that they were the largest online purveyor of human trafficking and, and prostitution in the world. They were supposedly in 97 countries. Uh, they were uh, affecting my state in a great way. And so we decided we wanted to start at the top and fortunately we had a lot of help doing that. And we wanted to send a message to the human trafficking community, yeah, if you're gonna do this, we may get you. And you know, sure, there may be other people that fill in if we take down backpage.com, 
Uh, but we're going to at least send that message that no one's above the law, no one's going to get away with this in the end. And so um, it was definitely a, a nice message for us to send to these human traffickers that we're here, we may be new, but we're coming after you. Thank you, General. Sean. Thanks very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is, it is truly an honor to be here with all of you. And I want to say at the outset, uh, as General Jennings hinted at, um, it, it's, it's an honor to be here together in a bipartisan way um, talking about this critical issue. A funny thing, before we came out, as they were telling us who was going to sit where, they said, Arias, you're going to be down at the far left of the table. And I thought and quipped kind of jokingly, that'll be the first time I'll be at the far left of any issue. <laughs> and it's funny. But in this particular issue, we are totally united. There is no left and right. This is not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. It's a human issue, humanitarian issue. All of us and all of our children and family members are potential victims, and so all of us are required to work together. There's no daylight between us as we fight, and it's, a, and it's an honor to be in this room with many people who I consider heroes in this fight, who've been in this fight a lot longer than, than we have. Uh, I, I do want to give credit where credit's due. I want to thank our president for taking a personal interest in this. I remember shortly after he took office, had the privilege of being in the Oval Office and showing him photos of young girls that we were able to rescue down in Haiti. And as I showed him and explained to him what was going on, he was very moved and he made a commitment. And I was, I'm sure, not the first one to talk to him about this issue. But he said, Sean, we are going to make this a priority, and he has and his family has. I want to give credit to the First Lady and to uh, Ivanka and Jared for making this a priority because it's empowered agencies across the United States to be able to take even more action. And that's exemplified by what's going on here at the Department of Justice. I want to give great credit to Attorney General Bill Barr for taking that challenge and uh, taking it to another level. Uh, we have amazing partners with our federal um, uh, agencies, and I want to thank again each and every one of you. Our good friend Tim Shea, who helped bring us together for this panel, uh, he's been a warrior on this subject and his counsel to the Attorney General. I know um, that he's providing a lot of wise uh, advice. Um, thank you to the private sector. I know there's some of you who are represented here. Uh, it's incumbent that you step up in this fight. If you don't, then government will try to solve it on its own. And although we're in government and we love government, government is not as efficient as the private sector. We need you uh, in this fight. We need the NGO space. Thank you to all of you, local, domestic, international, for doing what you do. And thank you so much to our survivors who are here and who are represented. It's amazing. Speaking of heroes, you are heroic. Using the pain and the anguish that you've suffered and channeling that in a positive way to be able to help lift others, it is, uh, it's inspirational. And so all of you, in, in, in uh, dedication to you, I brought my Captain America cufflinks and I'm kind of an uber geek and speak at a lot of Comic Con. So you don't see this, but I have Mandalorian socks on because my Baby Yoda ones um, uh, are, in the, are in the wash. Um, but that to me, uh, exemplifies too, it embodies the spirit of, of what we are. We're warriors all fighting um, together. And so uh, I know that didn't answer the question. It was a lot of introductory thank yous, but each of you has to know and realize what a significant impact you're making. And everyone who's watching this, whether it's being streamed or, or heard, you can make a difference. Uh, you are making a difference. If you even just understand the issue and educate yourself a little bit, you are making a difference. Um, how I got involved, uh, Tim made reference to it, so I won't go into great detail. Shortly after I came into office, I ended up handling, um, leading a case of a horrible, um, I almost hate to call him a human being, because I can't imagine. That he had spent over 15 years overseeing a reign of terror in small, quiet, quaint little Utah. It is an amazing state, but uh, hiding in plain sight, he terrorized. Uh, he was a narco trafficker and a human trafficker, as they often are. And he abused young children that he brought from Central America and that he found in Salt Lake City and forced them to mule his drugs throughout not just high schools, but junior high schools and elementary schools. And it took a lot of us, it took everyone in the community finally coming together to say no more. 
And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say, as Tim uh, mentioned, we've taken him off the streets uh, and he's never, ever coming back. And so um, that really opened my eyes immediately to the plight of so many victims throughout our state and throughout the world, frankly. And then shortly after that, um, I went with a, an organization that I helped build called Operation Underground Railroad, started by one of my dearest friends who left uh, federal, as a, as a superstar federal agent, left his badge, left his pension, everything, uh, just entirely on faith went out so that he could essentially become a confidential informant and help other nations empower themselves to protect themselves. And he went and set up stings around the world and took me on one. Um, and, and when I went down, this case changed my life forever in Cartagena, in Colombia, and we infiltrated a vast network of human traffickers, set them up, and uh, helped their local law enforcement take them down in what was a very large sting, over 121 little kids that we were able to rescue on that particular day. And it was the interaction with the children saying, thank you, Americans. God bless America. We love you, uh, Americans, because they knew this time, instead of Americans coming down to rape and abuse them, uh, which uh, just demoralizes me thinking about our countrymen doing that. This time we were going to get to take them home to their families that have been praying <coughs> for their safe return. And in that moment, I knew that the rest of my life, no matter what I did, whether AG or something else after, uh, it would be at least in part dedicated to fighting this um, human trafficking effort. And I, I hired a couple of consultants from right here in Washington, D.C. Probably not a, a wise move because I paid a lot of money. <laughs> And they said, what are your priorities? And number one, I said, I, I, I'm going to fight human trafficking. This is it. And so they did some polling, and they did some focus groups, and they came back and said, don't do that. It doesn't pass the smell test, the nice, fluffy cloud test. Um, besides, you've also picked fighting opioids and uh, suicide. You sound like a black cloud of death. Everything is about bad, evil stuff. And you need to get reelected. Uh, you'll be the shortest tenured AG in the history uh, of Utah. And um, unfortunately, I fired them, uh, didn't listen, and have been trying to talk about it as much as I can in my state to the point where the media has said, please stop talking about it. You talk too much about human trafficking. But to me, I'm still here, so I don't know what the consultants, uh, how much their advice was worth. I know the problem is still here, and Hopefully with all of your help and with the, the lift from these amazing leaders that I'm fortunate to be with up here, um, we can say that we'll, we'll make a true dent and someday maybe we'll eradicate this type of modern day slavery um, as we have uh, his other forms of historical slavery. So Tim, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Sean. I, I know I'm not supposed to answer my own question, but I, I think I first learned about this in a deep way, just listening to Sean Reyes present to a group of private sector uh, people. And when I was in private practice and he related, he underestimates his personal involvement in some of these issues and his passion for this, for this issue is beyond, uh, is not underestimated here. I think he's somebody who's educated countless leaders around the country and indeed the world. And I think that shows how the state AGs our leaders and really important to this whole process, so, so thank you for that. Um, I think it may make sense to uh, take a look <clears throat> because I think the, the, the issue of human trafficking is, is similar but yet different in different locations. So we're going to take a, the leaders, the chief law enforcement officers of these states here, I'd like to ask them to sort of describe what the problem looks like in their state and what they've done to respond to that. So we can, we can learn from that and then see what the similarities and differences may be. So if I could start with uh, uh, Kathleen Jennings, that'd be great. Sure, thank you. Uh, more than 40 million people live in slavery across the world and the issue is surely global and inter, interstate. Delaware, as you are aware, is, is located pretty much between Philadelphia and D.C., and we are along the I-95 corridor. And so uh, <coughs> sexual trafficking is a major problem in our state, and the, the ability to be mobile is also a major problem in our state. So it takes a concerted effort, I think, of both federal, state, and local authorities 
to really dive into what's going on. And, and as we know, these are crimes that are committed in secret. And unless we're there proactively rooting it out, it just goes on and on and on unabated. And the horrors of it we're well aware of. We've also uh, noticed that we have unique powers in Delaware that ha enable us to do things uh, that are creative and may not always be criminal in nature. For example, a couple of years ago, the legislature in Delaware passed a law that enables the Attorney General to petition the Court of Chancery to shut down a corporation if its primary purpose is illegality. And to date, uh, the first corporation that we sought to shut down successfully is none other than Backpage. <laughs> And we have a court order that removed its ability to operate as a corporation. Of course, the federal government and others have done a pretty good job at doing that as well. But it's a team effort all around. And so Backpage uh, will not exist, does not exist, and will not exist into the future. We also have utilized what we see um, you know, anywhere in any state are, quote, massage parlors where women are routinely sexually trafficked. And so we've utilized not only criminal jurisdiction, but also civil jurisdiction, civil RICO um, actions that have been filed by a man who's here today, Oliver Cleary, he's the Deputy Attorney General. And he was able to bring a civil RICO action against an owner of, I think, six illicit massage parlors. A uh, judge agreed to shut them down. There was a huge penalty, a financial penalty levied against the owner, and he was enjoined from ever opening a parlor in Delaware again. Now look, he will go somewhere else, which is why I say this has to be um, an interstate, federal and state effort. Those are just a few of the tools that Delaware has in the toolbox. We have a lot else to talk about. Um, and other tools that we can utilize and have utilized. We would like to be able to utilize more so the criminal tools that we have. Uh, we do have a Human Trafficking Act that was passed several years ago, and uh, it's a robust act, and it needs to be used more frequently. Thank you, General. General Paxton. Uh, much like you, I was wondering if uh, Sean Reyes was telling the truth about his socks, and I looked, and they are Mandalorian <laughs> socks, just so you know. <laughs> Um, my state, shockingly, is the, statistically the second worst state in the country for human trafficking. Houston is widely regarded as the hub. Uh, it is the worst city in America for human trafficking, largely because of its location uh, on the southern border. We, we cover about half of the southern border with Mexico, and as a result, we have lots of cartels, drug cartels, who are also not afraid to smuggle um, children and women. And so that is uh, part of the reason we struggle with this uh, horrifically uh, bad issue. And one of the things that, you know, you look at the statistics, you look at uh, these human trafficking cases that I could tell you about individually, and on a, on a piece of paper, they're just numbers and they're just statistics. Um, but the reality is when you, when you tell the story of each one of them, they're not just a number, they're not just a statistic, they're not just a prosecution. They affect the lives of these uh, particularly young women and so we've not only focused on prosecuting, but we've also had a tremendous emphasis on, on education because the more we can make people aware of this issue, the more likely we are to be able to stop it. If people recognize the warning signs as they're starting, we can hopefully save a lot of these, um, particularly young women, from going through horrific experiences for years and maybe stop it at the very beginning. And so one of the first things we did was we put together a video called Be the One. And it's, it's not your typical government video. I, I really encourage you to go to our website, uh, TexasAttorneyGeneral.gov. And on that website, we have an hour long, it's kind of like a documentary, but it, it, it's really vignettes of stories of people that were uh, young women, particularly that were involved in human trafficking that had no choice. And it tells a story of, of somebody that cared that stepped forward to, 
talk to these young women and find out what their situation was or just pay attention to what was going on in their neighborhood. Uh, one guy was just noticing that there was a lot of traffic at this house that no one seemed to live in, but there were people there all day driving back and forth and reported it. This was in Montgomery County, just north of Houston, very affluent neighborhood. And by his action, just videotaping all of these cars coming to and fro, he reported to the authorities and shut down one of the largest human trafficking rings in, in Texas. And so our focus really has been to get this video out, whether it's in our state or all over the country. I think this has gone to about 48 states. It's gone to almost 100 countries. And it's effective in teaching people to pay attention and to address warning signs so that we can stop this horrific crime before it starts. A little, bit of, uh, a little bit of background about Utah State, a smaller state with a little over 3 million in population. Um, I don't think we've had historically any more uh, rate of human trafficking, <coughs> but a few things that are, are unique challenges. For a, a small state, we have a disproportionately high number of international connections, and so there's a lot of international commerce uh, coming in and out. We have two major highways, I-15 and I-80, that make us uh, in some ways a crossroads, and so we get a lot of traffic coming from the west coast and coming up from the southern uh, border. And then we have an extremely trusting population in Utah, which makes people hyper vulnerable to things like uh, affinity fraud and white collar crime, but it also makes them sometimes oblivious to things like human trafficking. They just cannot believe that it'd be possible. And if somebody uh, who's a trafficker and running uh, young women from a different country back and forth, um, the neighbors would probably more likely assume that they're doing some English language program or exchange than running an illicit business. And so those are some of the challenges that I, I found when, when I came in. And some of the, the things that have been successful for us um, are similar to other things that General Paxton and General Jennings uh, mentioned. Education uh, is critical for us too. We've also tried to, you kind of have to entertain to educate sometimes, use celebrities. So we've called upon friends from the UFC or the NBA, NFL to kind of get engaged. We've used Ashton Kutcher. I brought Jackie Chan all the way from China. So he would come to Utah to help us educate and stay at the house. And um, General Paxton and I went back to China recently to reciprocate and talk to the Chinese government about this issue. They weren't um, as ready to engage as robustly, but they were interested and they were talking. So education at that level generally to the public, but the other education has been um, like Ken said, really with a lot of partnerships, um, private sector ones, <coughs> truckers against trafficking, airline ambassadors, hotel heroes. I mean, pretty much any industry or organization that wants to engage with us, we will engage with to train uh, social organizations, Kiwanis, uh, Rotary, uh, Lions, it, you name it, and we'll go out and talk about it. And that's, that's been helpful uh, for us. Um, it, it also helps to have uh, private sector uh, champions. Um, one of them, my former chief of staff, went to one of our largest companies, and so she immediately started a program uh, similar to what Rachel Brand did here, who left uh, Justice, and now with Walmart has done amazing things to help that uh, corporation uh, do more on the human trafficking front. So all of those things have really helped wake people up in our state, um, getting resources every legislative session for victims, because I think that survivors, that's probably the most critical part of the equation and sometimes the part that's most overlooked. The, the investigations are critical, the prosecutions are essential, the education and legislation also, but that rehabilitation, the aftercare side is so critical and that's what we've tried to focus our attention on. Make sure we're not re-victimizing them at any point throughout the case and make sure they have resources on the back end to start to put their lives back together again. We've, we've leveraged technology in a lot of different ways, don't have time to talk about it all, from AI and data aggregation to uh, tip reports and other really um, interesting, I think some cutting edge uh, opportunities there. And then the last thing that I think we benefit from is just the structure. Our legislature gave the Attorney General's office uh, the power to be able to convene any law enforcement assets from around the state. So really we get to quarterback through our secure strike force all of the concerted efforts which are required statewide because no single agency in my state has the capacity to be able to do it alone. 
And so together, we've been able to take down massive multi-county, uh, um, 10 uh, massage parlor cases at a time, recently with Arizona, Arkansas, and other states, a huge uh, alleged human trafficking adoption case because it's still pending and we still have to make our case. Um, but we see everything, sex, sex exploitation, labor. The only cases that we haven't seen domestically in Utah, the, fortunately, are uh, organ harvesting cases like we've seen and, and done in many other um, jurisdictions, in, in other countries. So we see it all, we fight it all, and we need everyone's help in Utah, just like we do uh, around the country. May I add one thing as yes, well? Yes, please. Um, I don't know if there are any judges in the audience, but the court can really play a pivotal role. Delaware for several years had uh, a court in its misdemeanor system, court system, and a good friend of mine ran it. It was a trauma-informed court that people arrested for prostitution, disorderly conduct, loitering, uh, would be sent to, and it was mostly women. And it's interesting because when we think of problem solving courts, we wanna measure that by, okay, uh, drug court. How many people have successfully completed drug counseling? Great, your court works. But in this particular court, it was the only safe place for the women sent there to go and to talk. And they would gather together in the courtroom with the judge and they would tell the judge, you know, this is what's going on in our lives. This is, these are the realities of how we live. And there were a series of murders of, of uh, women in our largest city and they were frightened. And so it became a court where we could teach how can you be safe? And I used to go routinely and, and speak and I felt like they had a place to go. And they got services there that they otherwise would not have gotten. You couldn't measure the success of that court by saying, oh, it lowered the number of arrests. It didn't. Um, but the way you measured the success of that court was how safe the women were who were there on a weekly or a monthly basis. It really worked. And I think we ought to explore those sorts of alternative courts. They weren't being prosecuted, they were being helped. Thank you, General. I think it shows how the states are truly laboratories and, and ways for us to learn from each other and, and help collaborate on these issues. Um, one thing I wanted to pick up on that uh, General Reyes mentioned was technology and something that's topical today in the news. Uh, you'll, you'll recall it. the Attorney General yesterday announced the conclusion of his investigation of the incident in Pensacola, the terrorist incidents involving the Royal Saudi military. And, and one of the, the issues in that case was one that spills over into many others. It was the phone that was used by the terrorist uh, was actually, he dropped it on the, on the floor and shot it in order to prevent the government from recovering anything on it. Uh, we've tried, we've obtained a search warrant, we have legal process, but we're unable uh, to open the phone, and, and Apple has not cooperated to the extent that they that they could. So I, I know that's one we see it a lot in terrorism cases. But maybe one of the maybe General Jennings can mention how it can affect a lot of other cases, including human trafficking. Sure, thank you. So uh, when our seating arrangement was made, I, I am to the right. <laughs> it's safe to say I'm usually to the left, uh, except for this issue. I've spent most of my career prosecuting cases, murder cases, kidnapping cases, domestic violence cases. If the government has probable cause to get into your home, they get a search warrant. And the courts tell us that the home is the most sacrosanct, private place we can be. Everybody uses their phones. And it is unfathomable to me that if I'm investigating or prosecuting a first degree murder case, if I am investigating a child abduction case, or if there is a case of domestic terror, which as a state AG I'm not investigating, but it's, these are horrific crimes. 
And if there is probable cause to get in the phone, we ought to be able to get in the phone. It saves people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, can I just make a, uh, it's not a rebuttal at all. I totally agree with um, General Jennings, except I used to be a tech GC, mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say, um, again, th that is a concern. I do want to give some credit because we work with a lot of tech companies and partners who've been fantastic, Apple right. included, has been a great partner in some cases that we've asked for help and they've given it, Facebook, many other ones. And so th this isn't a black and white issue and we might have issues on a particular case, but uh, overall, at the state level at least, we've found them to be willing partners and they've put a lot of resources towards empowering us to do our jobs. And so in fairness, I just want to make no, sure. No, that no, we, we look forward to their cooperation for sure. Let's, let's. You want the general counsel's cell number here. Uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you. Um, so let, let, me, let me also uh, pick up on a theme that was, I think, throughout the whole presentation. Maybe, I don't know if we have the time. Uh, we're doing our time here. Okay, so why don't we use this as a way to, to close up the summation of each, but I think one of the themes that, that certainly was through this, uh, every part of the, the, uh, the presentations here by these distinguished presenters was partnerships. And I know that the way to solve this is gonna be a partnership, and I, I agree with, with Sean, I think it's gonna to have to involve the private sector, the tech companies and others involved federal government and, and the states and the local prosecutors, but I'd like to sort of ask each, each one of our presenters to sort of touch on that issue and how, how, how partnerships can really advance our, our, um, our roles here, so. Okay. Sure, thank you. Uh, and I will say that we've had great cooperation from tech companies as well. I'm not picking on anyone, I'm just saying. Uh, but, you know, in closing, I, I want to, take this right back to the survivors. Um, we all need to do the best job we possibly can to help them, to give them a safe place to stay, to give them the services that they need, to nurture them along whatever course they choose. That's the key here, that we are saving lives when we focus on the survivors. And I think that in many states, we are challenged with, you know, where does someone go? I mean, just to sleep for the night, where do they go? And so we're working very hard in Delaware to make sure there is a safe place and that it is specific to the trauma that mostly women, not all women, but mostly women are going through uh, and their children as well. And so I think uh, that as we get into the private sector, that's an area where I'd like to come knocking on some doors and see what we can do in the near future uh, to create that safety and that help. Thank you. General Pax. Well, I definitely think that uh, prosecution education <coughs> partnerships are the key to, to solving this problem. And even in the short amount of time that we've been dealing with this in Texas in my office in the four years that we've had our unit, it's been partnerships that have really made the difference, whether it was Backpage.com, the partnership with the Department of Justice of California, some U.S. attorneys, we couldn't have done that alone. And I don't think they could have done it alone. And I think, I think that's something that we need to think more about. We've done, uh, we've had a real focus on partnerships. We, we have a, a, a truckers association and so, they end up being eyes and ears for us all over Texas in places that we could never go. And they can do things we can't do. They, it's just amazing what they've been able to report. Um, and I think you have to be creative in how you look for partnerships. I had the opportunity when the governor was, uh, he was in uh, India, and this is gonna sound like a kind of a weird uh, ending, but I ended up getting to present a trophy at the uh, Dell Match Play Tournament in Austin, a golf tournament. And it was a great day. At the end of the day, I presented this tro trophy to Bubba Watson, who won the tournament. And I noticed that there was a guy off to the side. He looked kind of familiar. And uh, I went up and started chit-chatting with this guy. And, and, um, and I asked him, I said, you know, do you know much about human trafficking? And I started explaining to him the, the horrible statistics of, of Texas' story on human trafficking. And he goes, you know, I had no idea. And I said, well, you know, would you be willing to, like, do some type of video with me and, um, you know, with your status, 
promote doing something about human trafficking? And the guy said, well, let, me, let my people talk to your people. And uh, so I, I was pretty, pretty sure that Matthew McConaughey was going to say no. And um, ultimately, he, he decided to do the, the video. And his production team put this video out with us. Um, hundreds of thousands of people saw it because of his celebrity status. And for me, it was kind of an interesting uh, promotion because I had been in the house uh, for 10 years and my daughters and my kids were really young when that happened, so they, they weren't very aware of what I was doing. When I ran for the ten Senate, they were teenagers and they didn't care. And then when I ran for the, the, the uh, Attorney General spot, they were still kind of teenagers. And they, they, I think they were slightly impressed. But when I did this video with Matthew McConaughey, my daughters called me and said, Dad, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I finally made it with my, with my girls. But, I, I tell you that story to say, I think there's all kinds of opportunities when we're willing to talk about this issue. Um, you'll be surprised at how many people, once you've told them the story, how many people in your state and your area of influence will be willing to be a part of making a difference in stopping this horrible crime. Okay, minute and a half, Tim. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, find the NGOs in your area, like Operation Underground Railroad or Child Liberation Foundation or heroes that we have in Utah, find the companies that are willing to work for you, large or small. We've got doTERRA and Maloof, massive companies that are allocating resources. They're ready, willing, and able. They just need you to reach out to them. Find champions in the legislature. Find the technology solutions. We have amazing AI aggregator, Banjo, that's helping us find human trafficking before anybody else even knows about it. And lastly, look for grants. We could not do what we do without the Department of Justice grants that we have had. And so it's also a shameless plug because we need to continue to have them. <laughs> but that's our Trafficking in Persons Task Force, the opportunity for us to bring every stakeholder in our state together. And we allocate half of the funds from DOJ just to survivor resources. But that's where the magic happens for us in the state of Utah. So look for those opportunities. Get out of your comfort zone. We need you. Every victim needs you because there are many of them out there who've lost hope and think that everyone's forgotten about them and that they'll never get out of the life, we can make a difference. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to, uh, I think we've come to the end of our time, but I think you'll agree that this was a great way to start the conference and with the leaders here up with me, and I want to ask you to uh, join me in thanking them for, for their presentations. If there's one lesson we've learned on the front lines of our fight against human trafficking, it's definitely the power of partnerships. These partnerships extend across the Department of Justice and beyond, encompassing federal, state, local, tribal, and international law enforcement, government agencies, nonprofit organizations dedicated to assisting victims and individuals at risk, faith-based and community groups, private industry, and of course the survivors themselves. So I would really like to thank um, AG Jennings, AG Paxton, and AG Reyes again for their leadership locally and nationally on this issue and for taking the time to be here today.